For most of human history, life has been hard and lifespans short. Average life expectancy from the Neolithic to the early medieval, about 10,000 years, hovered at around 30 to 35. That's not to say that everyone immediately dropped dead by the age of 35. Some of the earliest records document a very few individuals living into their 80s and 90s, and an extremely rare few making it past 100. But to truly understand the life expectancy of the day requires an understanding of average mortality. Prior to the 19th century, 14% of children died before their first birthday. 60% of those who survived their first year would die before the age of 5, and of the remainder, 30% of those would be dead by the age of 15. To put that into perspective, imagine 100 children, all born on January the 1st, 1700. Only 15 would be expected to live until January the 1st, 1715. Of those that reached adulthood, harsh living and working conditions, poor nutrition, war and disease would all take their brutal toll. But by far the greatest killer before the modern day was bacterial infection. The smallest cut could have become infected, and if an infected toe, foot or finger, hand or limb was amputated, there was above a 90% chance the operative wound itself would become infected, leading to sepsis and shortly after, death. Bacterial diseases such as tuberculosis, typhoid, leprosy, meningitis, diphtheria, whooping cough, pneumonia and bubonic plague were common. There were attempts to treat them with poisons. The French pox, better known as syphilis, was treated with mercury, a poison so strong that it was a lottery as to which would die first, the bacteria or the patient. If the patient survived, the mercury poisoning would eventually cause its own dramatic problems. But a means to prevent the deaths caused by these bacterial infections had been used for centuries in its naturally existing form. Arab stable boys knew they could treat infections in horses by administering cultures of mould, and in Britain, ostlers would prevent infection from chafing after long hours in the saddle by administering old strips of mouldy leather to the affected areas. And in Poland, during the 17th century, wet bread and spider webs were used to dress wounds and stop infections from developing. These sound like old wives' tales, but they worked. The reason for the ability to successfully prevent infection was down to the fungal spore that today we call penicillin. The search for a magic bullet, a chemical treatment that would selectively target a disease-causing pathogen without affecting the host, began in earnest in the early 20th century. By 1909, the German scientist and Nobel laureate Paul Ehrlich discovered asphenamine, a compound that successfully combated the spirulum spirichet bacterium, which causes syphilis. Only one year later, his discovery was marketed under the name Salvasan and became the most widely administered drug in the world. But it was not the desired cure-all. It targeted syphilis well enough, but it had no effect on other pathogens. For almost 20 years, research into the new medical science of chemotherapy stalled, until, in 1928, a chance observation by a famously untidy Scotsman was to change the way we treated bacterial infections forever. Alexander Fleming was born on the 6th of August, 1881. The son of a farmer, he excelled at his studies and was awarded a two-year scholarship at Kilmarnock Academy and later attended the Royal Polytechnic Institution at London. At 16, he took a position at a shipping office, where he worked for four years until an inheritance from an uncle gave him the financial freedom to study at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in Paddington. Fleming had served as a private in the London Scottish Regiment of the Volunteer Force since 1900, where he proved to be a fine marksman, and during his studies, he became a member of the Rifle Club at St. Mary's Medical School. After he gained his degree, the captain of the rifle club was keen to retain him as a member, so suggested he join the research team at the hospital. This he did, and became assistant bacteriologist to Sir Almroth Wright, a pioneer in vaccine therapy and immunology. In 1914, at the beginning of World War I, Alexander Fleming was commissioned into the Royal Army Medical Corps at the rank of lieutenant. He served at several field hospitals in France during the war and was mentioned in dispatches several times for his bravery in attending to the wounded on the battlefield in the face of heavy enemy fire. It was during this time that he submitted an article to the renowned medical journal The Lancet. In the article, he explained why the antiseptics in common use were killing more soldiers than infections. The antiseptics were effective on the surface, but bacteria was often beyond the reach of these antiseptics in deep wounds that the soldiers often suffered. 
Fleming's friend and mentor, Sir Almroth Wright, strongly supported his findings, yet despite this, the majority of military physicians continued to use the supplied antiseptics, often worsening the condition of their patients. When war ceased in 1918, Fleming returned to St. Mary's Hospital, where he began his research into immunotherapy. Over the next decade, he made several important discoveries, including his discovery of the lysosome enzyme. His work had earned him two distinct reputations. Firstly, he was regarded by his peers as a truly brilliant researcher, and secondly, he seemed completely incapable of keeping his laboratory tidy. In early August of 1928, Fleming had been investigating Staphylococci, the anaerobic bacterium responsible for many of the sepsis-related deaths he had witnessed during his war service in France. Before leaving for his family holiday, he had stacked the cultures of Staphylococci on a bench in the corner of his laboratory, and without a second thought, just left the lab. On September 3rd, he returned to begin his work when he noticed that the lid on one of his culture dishes had detached, and the contents were contaminated with a fungus. What Fleming noticed was the colonies of Staphylococci immediately surrounding the fungus had been destroyed, whilst the Staphylococci blooms further away appeared unaffected. Fleming showed the contaminated culture to his former assistant, Merlin Price, who reminded him that's how he discovered lysozyme. He eventually identified the mould as a member of the genus Penicillium, and for several months after, he referred to the substance it produced as simply mould juice. No doubt, realising the term would not suffice, on the 7th of March 1929, he named it Penicillin. The British Journal of Experimental Pathology published Fleming's findings, but the article generated little interest. Further investigations had revealed that cultivating the penicillium fungus was extremely difficult, and after the mould had been grown successfully, it was even more difficult to isolate the desired antibiotic. At Oxford University, one Ernst Chain found Fleming's 1929 article on penicillin and proposed to his supervisor, Howard Florey, that he try to isolate the compound. In 1939, Howard Florey assembled a team, including the fungal expert Norman Heatley, who worked on growing penicillium in large amounts, and Ernst Chain, who managed to successfully purify penicillin from an extract of the mould. It was Florey who oversaw the animal trials. On May 25, 1939, the group injected eight mice with a virulent strain of Streptococcus, and then injected four of them with penicillin. The other four mice provided the control. Early the next morning, all the control mice were dead, but all the penicillin-treated mice were still alive. Chain called the results a miracle, and their success could not have come at a better time. 1939 saw Europe once again devoured by war, as the Allies desperately tried to fight back against the might of the Third Reich, the death toll was high, as were the injuries. And although some progress had been made in their treatment, infection was still all too common, with many of the procedures employed during World War I still being used to treat the infections. The means to mass-produce penicillin was now more essential than ever. Howard Florey and Norman Heatley had to travel to the US to deliver the sample of penicillium notatum to the American team. The amount that they had was so small and valuable that they dare not carry it in a vial for fear of loss or theft. So, in the true British spirit of simple fixes in a crisis, they smeared the sample over both their coats and vowed not to remove them for the entirety of the journey. Arriving in Peoria, Illinois, to meet with Charles Tom, the principal mycologist of the US Department of Agriculture, and Andrew Jackson Moyer, director of the department's Northern Research Laboratory, the sample was extracted from their coats and they set to work. The team knew that of over a thousand known strains of the penicillium mould, only three produced the valuable penicillin. Fleming's penicillium notatum was yielding good results at the Illinois facility, but Charles Tom wanted to try a third strain, penicillium chrysogenum. The difficulty was they didn't have a sample, but fate was on their side when they found a sample on a mouldy cantaloupe they bought at a local fruit market. This strain proved to produce six times as much penicillin as that used by Fleming. But another problem arose. During production, they exhausted the supply of the medium used to stimulate mould growth. A.J. Moyer suggested they try cornsteep liquor, a waste product of the cornstarch industry. This was freely available in vast quantities in the U.S. Midwest, and trials immediately showed an exponential increase in the quality of penicillin that they could produce. Flory headed off on a six-month mission around the U.S. to encourage pharmaceutical companies to begin their own research into increasing production of penicillin. 
and when the United States joined the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, they took over the entire manufacturing process of penicillin production. By the end of 1941, there wasn't enough penicillin in the entire United States to successfully treat a single patient. By the end of 1942, there was barely enough to treat 100 patients. But thanks to the monumental efforts of the British and American teams, by 1943, there was enough penicillin stockpiled to treat the entire Allied forces. Between 1939 and 1945, 20 million Allied soldiers died on the battlefields of Europe defending the world against the threat of Nazi Germany. Of those that survived their injuries, it is estimated that over a million owed those lives solely to the use of penicillin. And these are the heroes who suffered the pain of progress.